that was that was definitely a question. Let's pray, and then here's what I'd like to do. I'm going to open up, because we didn't have a whole lot of time for questions last week, so if anybody had any lingering questions, that's, that'd be fine, and then I'm going to carry on with what I got, tell you uh, what this week's going to look like in my world, because it's going to be very exciting, and then we'll, uh, we'll go from there. Let's pray. Lord, thanks for today. Father, I thank you for this church. Thank you that, uh, that you have been pleased to save us, to call us together as a community. Lord, I pray that we would have wisdom as we think through some very difficult things. Um, I pray, Lord, that you would help us uh, to respond with both clarity and grace to the wrongs that we see done. I pray that we would know what you would have us do in terms of the stewardships of the resources that you've been pleased to give us. Uh, Lord, these are things that are, that are difficult to think through and process. And so, Lord, we pray, thanking you that you've told us that if we ask for wisdom, that you would give it. So, Lord, I pray uh, for my sake that you grant wisdom to us. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so if you were here last week and there are any lingering questions, what are they? Yes, Kevin. Oh, well, you're waving at the baby. Okay, never mind. I thought you were asking a question. I thought it was kind of weird that he waved, that he asked a question like this, but okay. All right. <laughs> yeah, okay, so a brief recap. Uh, we talked about Southern Baptist Structure, how the cooperative program works, which is what all this is up here to do. Um, the, the problem is the executive committee, which was designed to simply allocate Southern Baptist resources to different places, has, had grown to the point where it really didn't have either transparency nor accountability. And the result of that has been, there were, there were multiple abuse cases that have been covered up. There were multiple victims that have been either intimidated or bullied or simply ignored. And so Guideposts, an independent firm, did an investigation on these things and discovered some things that we already knew uh, to be the case. When we finished last week, I think we were on to uh, the lawyer, August Bodo, and kind of what he had, how he had been such an instrumental part covering up and keeping a list of offenders that, uh, that was like a private list so that they could protect the Southern Baptist Convention ultimately from legal liability. So that was, that was where we, we, that was kind of the end of point two. So point three, the third thing the, the, the um, report found was different patterns of intimidation by usually uh, the pastors of the largest churches in our denomination. And so, uh, for instance, Steve Gaines, who was president, of the Southern Baptist Convention of 2018-2019 intentionally covered up an instance of abuse of a staff member at his church uh, and did nothing to report it and tried to help relocate this guy and get him a new job, and he still has his job. Now, the reason that he still has his job, that Steve Gaines does, is because he pastors Bellevue Baptist in Memphis, which is one of the largest churches. Hey, Chris, welcome back. And, uh, and so, well, the Internet just knew that Chris was back. I'm sorry, I forgot I was being recorded. Um, Jack Graham, who's pastor at Prestonwood Baptist Church, ha did the same thing. Prestonwood is about a 15,000-member church. Get your head around that. Um, in right outside of Dallas, Texas. Paige Patterson, we talked about him, president of the SBC, president of the Southeastern Seminary. And then Paul Pressler, um, who I could tell you more about Paul Pressler than you ever wanted to know. But all of these guys um, are, are guilty. And there were other names that were named, but these were four of the more prominent ones. Number one is instead of advocating for the victims of abuse and trying to get them help and to do things the right way and to terminate those who are guilty, these men instead covered up the abuse, tried to ignore the victims, and sometimes would even intentionally create stories that weren't true about them, and, uh, and then proceeded to keep what we would affectionately call the good old boy system in place at kind of the top points of the Southern Baptist Convention. Um, so there's a, there's a pattern that was predictable there. And then the, the fourth part of the report was, a, was how resistant uh, the SBC had been to reform. Um, there was, in 2008, a proposal made that there be a database uh, that would include the names of all um, people who had been, uh, had, 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 a, had, had a actual uh, case against them uh, for any kind of abuse or neglect. And, uh, and it was resisted on multiple points and had continued to be resisted until last year. And it has looked different different times in different ways. So, so there, 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 that's one example of, of the, 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 uh, the resistance to reform. Most of those 
most of those uh, resistances to reform happened primarily during the, the time that a guy named Ronnie Floyd uh, was the head of the executive committee. And he just continued to, I don't know how else to tell you, he continued to ignore and stick his head in the sand and refused to address the fact that there were lingering problems in the Southern Baptist Convention, um, acted like there was nothing wrong. And the reality of it is, and this is we're not the first or only entity that experiences this, until somebody from the outside comes in and forces uh, people to admit that there's a problem. People don't admit that there's a problem. And so uh, for the better part of three years, Ronnie Floyd refused to allow anybody to investigate. When he finally did, when he finally said, okay, we're going to do this, he didn't want, this happened at the floor of the SBC last year. He said, well, we'll investigate, but we'll do an internal investigation to see if we have done anything wrong. Now, what could possibly go wrong with an entity investigating itself? I mean, that seems totally above board, right? No. And so they, um, the, the delegate said, no, it needs to be an independent third party, and it was, and the results were this, were this document. Now, a lot of the stuff at the end of this was issues with the, the credentials committee. Let me explain what the credentials committee is. The goal of the, goal of the credentials, let me just call it the CC. The goal of the CC was, is to investigate uh, churches that are in cooperation with the Southern Baptist Convention to see if there was credible evidence or if there has been some sort of, of you know, accusation levied against them that is founded. And if it is, uh, then they, we would, they call it disfellowshipping. We would no longer be in cooperation as Southern Baptist with a church that had people who were guilty of those things. Okay? That, was, that was the intent. Um, it, it was just poorly run for a couple of reasons. Number one is you understand most of the stuff like that, the EC, the executive committee, people like that are a general exception. Most of the things in the Southern Baptist Convention are run by pastors. And I don't, I don't know about all the rest of the pastors in the SBC. I can't speak for them, but my schedule is generally pretty busy, which makes it very difficult for me to do things on behalf of the denomination. And the denominational structure exists on three levels, Right. So as pastor of a Southern Baptist church in the upstate of South Carolina, there are three different levels of denominationalism I can choose to involve myself in. I don't have to, but I can choose to. And that's associations. Okay? So the association, we are part of what's called the Three Rivers Baptist Association. Three Rivers Baptist Association in ours, that's 88 churches in Greer and Traveler's Rest. And we do, we do pretty good things together. In fact, here this week on Thursday, we had a group called Thrive that I lead, which is um, six other pastors in this part of the county who we just get together and talk about ministry stuff, which is really helpful. We've got two guys right now who are in very difficult churches and who honestly just need the opportunity to, to talk and be encouraged. I'm not one of those guys, by the way. But they just need time to talk and be encouraged and to encourage one another. And so it's really cool. And that stuff happens at the association level. To me, that's Baptist work at its best. I think the association is really where Baptist work happens the best because there's the least opportunity for corruption, if that makes sense. All right. After the associational level, you have the state, the, the state convention. So we are part of the South Carolina Baptist Convention. All right. That is 1,400 churches across the state of South Carolina, uh, and we all cooperate for the sake of missions and other sorts of things. The state convention is, it's a little harder to get involved than, than the association, but not much. And then finally, you've got the National Southern Baptist Convention, which is 14,000 churches around the world, which is a very high number. And so <coughs> this, given, given this structure, right, a pastor has to ultimately choose which one of these he's really going to be actively involved in. And it's good for Southern Baptist pastors to be involved somewhere, because if we're not, well, then who's left to make all the decisions? And the answer is either the biggest churches who can send people or the, uh, or the, the people who are employed by the denomination. That makes sense? And so you want to be represented somewhere. It's just a matter of where you choose. So for us, if you're wondering, well, where has Scott been involved? Up until this year, this was where I was involved at the state convention, but many of you guys know that. Um, this year, I have, I have shifted that, and I have found myself far more involved in what's going on in the life of the association uh, because I think that one of the things that's going to come out of this whole thing 
is that you're going to see less churches involved, less churches financially involved at the national level and more churches involved at the local and associational level because you can know these churches, you can know these leaders, and you can know how they're spending money, and that seems really, really wise to me. As a, as a guy who teeter-totters on the edge of libertarianism, I like this, okay, because this is, this is like government that rules least sort of stuff, right? So Travis Kearns will tell you, Travis is our associational leader, and some of you met Travis. Travis is a friend of mine. We've been buddies for 30 years. He'll tell you that uh, he has no desire to come in here and tell us how to operate this church. None. Zero. And, uh, and, and he will say that to every church that he's a part of. And that's good, because that's what Southern Baptists are. Because one of the linchpins of being Southern Baptist is local church autonomy. Each church is responsible for making its own decisions. And so the Credentials Committee then meets with individual churches and decides we're gonna, this church can continue to cooperate as a Southern Baptist church, or it cannot when those churches have cases that they maybe have mishandled abuse. Now, that can, that can go really well. We had, we had to do this as an association just two years ago with a church that willfully and intentionally hired a convicted sex offender as the pastor of its church. And we went and spoke. I was part of the team that did this. This was incredibly difficult. We went and spoke to this church. We told them this was the problem. We said, you cannot continue to do this. They said, you cannot, con you cannot tell us what to do. We said, you're exactly right, but we can refuse to accept your money and refuse to, to say that you're a part of our association. And that is the best that the Southern Baptist Convention can do, right? Everybody follow? We said that last week. The Southern Baptist Convention is not a denomination. We cannot look at a church and tell it to close its doors cannot do that it just doesn't work that way right but what we can do is say we're no longer going to be in cooperation with this church and so we we had to make that decision at the association level it happened three times last year across our state and over 50 times across the nation but you got 14,000 churches right you understand so uh, it, zero is the tolerable number I get that there should never be any but among 14,000 churches you're going to have some churches that do things the wrong way right you just are and so so the Credentials Committee is supposed to do this, and, and they were really tasked with a lot of other stuff uh, that they had a hard time doing. Um, so so the, the last, I don't know, 50, 60 pages of the report are really ways that the Credentials Committee kind of failed to do their job, um, which it was the first year of it. I think given the task that they had, they did probably did a pretty good job, but there's some things that they could improve on. And so that's where that... That's where the report kind of stops. It gives you those four areas. Now, here are, I want to talk through the recommendations. They came out this week. The recommendations that the task force has made for us as Southern Baptists to adopt. I'm going to tell you how I feel about these and why. And this is totally open for discussion. Okay? But, but I want to give, I'm going to give you my opinion because... Keep in mind, I think I said this last week, if I have it before, when you look at denominationalism of any kind, Southern Baptist or otherwise, everybody in that is a sinner, right? And, and, and every, there, there are no heroes. We said this about history. No heroes. Jesus is the hero, right? Everybody else sinners. Jesus is the hero. When we start to paint humans to look like heroes, we get in, pro in trouble. And when we start to just think that there's just good without some kind of motive behind it, we also get in trouble. So I want you to understand the problem, the tension that we're facing here, okay, we, is if you're thinking about how the whole thing is being polarized, which is what's happening, there's kind of three groups here, okay, you've got group, you've got group number one, group number one is very against, so let's say against the, the abuse that has happened in the SBC, okay, they're very against it. They think it's totally wrong and sinful and it should not happen. But they're also, but they're for local church autonomy. They realize that it's very difficult to regulate in the Southern Baptist Convention how churches conduct themselves. There are only so many things that we can do, right? They are against... And we've talked about this in length, the critical race theory. We're very familiar with what's happening in terms of how you're seeing this happen in our denomination, but not just in our denomination, in our country. The critical race theory is growing, and so they, they see that there's inherent danger in there. And, <coughs> and so, so you've got these, these are probably, those are probably three good ones. All right, we're going to go with group three. I'm going to put two in the middle. Group three 
is very against the abuse that's happening in the SBC. They're not against local church autonomy, but local church autonomy is not a priority. Now, what that means is, this is going to be the group that's going to say, we need to be very clear about how we handle all of these different things as a denomination and then dictate to the church how they should handle these things. Now, on the outside, that doesn't sound inherently bad, but there's this thing called the law of unintended consequences. What are the unintended consequences of the denomination telling each individual church how to handle all of the, even the good things that happen in their church? What are the consequences? Yeah. Right, so instead of now the, the Bible dictates to the church and then the church governs itself, you have the SBC dictating to the church and you've cut out the Bible. You guys, it is like a priest, yes. You become more of a denomination than you will. It's everything that's wrong with, and I love my Presbyterian brothers. I went to a Presbyterian seminary. It's everything that's wrong with Presbyterianism, okay? In that you've got a few group, a few at the top, or Methodism for that matter. You've got a few at the top dictating to all of the churches, regardless of context, how they're supposed to conduct themselves. That, does everybody feel the tension here? Okay, I want you to feel that because this is, the, this is the tension that's coming with the recommendations that I'm about to give you. Because some of them are good, but they all come with these consequences that, are, that we've got to come to grips with, and that's understanding. And then you've got group two, which is a very, very small percentage of people that we're, that, I say we, I just gave away where I am. I'm against, I'm against abuse. Yes, check. I am, I am for local church autonomy. Check. I am against CRT. Check. Right? These folks would be kind of more towards the critical race theory side, and they wouldn't even say they're critical race theorists, but they're far more sympathetic to the arguments of critical race theory than we would be. You guys follow me? I don't want to paint with a broad brush, and I'm not trying to be judgmental. I'm literally trying, I'm trying to be charitable. If, if, I've got dear friends who are in this camp, and if they were standing here, I would say this the same way with them standing here, because I don't want to be uncharitable. I don't believe that this is going to keep them from being in heaven. I just think they may be misguided. No more than I believe that, you know, my Presbyterian brothers are not going to heaven, you know, because they baptize babies. I mean, I think they're wrong, but I don't think that's going to send them to hell. You know, like, and, it, and that's, so, so, so same sort of thing here, right? So, so there's this group <laughs> that's in the middle, and this is where I typically feel like I am. It's not moderate, it's just, yes ma'am? The difference between one and two, that's a great question, that's why I'm going to get you, I, 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 that's why I'm going to answer. It's kind of against this, but here, these folks in group one are also for, and I don't know how else to put it, the good old boy system. In other words, they believe not, not that we should go back to just biblical principles, but that we should go back to the way Southern Baptists have always been. You guys follow me? Yeah, keep things, but not even keep, yes, maintain status quo, not even keep things the way they are, make things the way they were in the 80s. Okay, so, so they would, you'd see, so I'm going to give you an example. I can use this, he was on the internet. Uh, First Baptist Church, Dallas, last Sunday, had as its guest preacher, Paige Patterson. Now, you guys remember all the stuff I told you about Paige Patterson? Paige Patterson's the same guy who a, a young lady came into his, was going to come into his office. He sent an email to his guys saying that his goal was to break her down. Made all these kind of horrendous comments about women in sermons and is just generally a sexist and a misogynist. You, I, I, I don't know how else to paint that, right? This guy spoke at First Baptist Dallas. Now, there's a reason this guy spoke at First Baptist Dallas. Because this group, generally speaking, desires to keep Southern Baptist life the way it's always been. So that's the difference between one and two. Two is this group of people that looks at this and says, well, this is broken. And looks at this and says, well, that's broken too. <sighs> right? And that, you want to know how I feel anytime I go to a Southern Baptist meeting of any kind. I just described it to you. <sighs> Right? That's, I mean, because it, this just frustrates me. Broken system, broken people. You guys got it? Like, I, I'm never, I'm never going to stand here and try to defend the Southern Baptist Convention to you because the Lord, the truth is the Lord Jesus doesn't need it. He'll advance his kingdom without us just fine. Thank you very much. I want you to understand how things are functioning and why we're staying. Does that make sense? Like, that's, that's what I'm going for. And like I said, I'm here, you know, last week I said two things. Either one, we're going to go, we're going to do this. We're going to work hard. I'm going to have a voice. So are a lot of other guys. 
and change is going to happen, and we're going we're gonna to be glad that we stayed and fought, or two, two, three years down the road, we're going to bang our heads bloody against a brick wall and go, well, this isn't working, and we're going to walk out the door and say, we can't stay anymore, right? That's, that's it. That's what's going to happen. But we can't just sit here knowing that all this stuff is broken and not try to fix it. Did somebody raise a hand? Did I miss that? I thought I saw a hand. Okay, cool. Yes. Yes. So here's the problem. If you do not associate with the national convention, you don't get to associate with the state or the local association. Because they're all Southern Baptists. Yeah, well, sort of. It's because the Southern Baptist Convention knows if you let associations start letting in non-Southern Baptist churches, then they don't need us anymore. So Three Rivers is Southern Baptist. It, all 88 churches in the Three Rivers Association are Southern Baptist. Yes. So, right? <sighs> yes. You feel it. That's the tension. I haven't even got to the recommendations yet. All right. So, so here, here are what they're recommending, Okay. And I'm going to read it, and it's all, it's kind of legalese, so I'm going to try to explain what they're saying as much as I can understand, and some of you guys may be able to understand it better. Here's the first. With respect to Baptist polity, polity is the way churches are run, right? Task force addresses the following suggestions and requests to cooperating state conventions, SBC entities, and other related Baptist bodies. Now, you notice what they can't do. They're, not, they're trying to real hard to make it clear that they can't mandate to state conventions and entities and Baptist bodies, what they should do, but, but ultimately, they kind of are. Okay, here's, so number one, request that the executive committee, everybody knows what the executive committee is, right? Evaluate staffing needs for the credentials committee and also hire a designated trained staff person or independent contractor to receive reports of abuse for the purpose of determining the appropriate church entity or association to respond to those allegations and to assist the credentials committee as needed. Now let me explain. So remember how I said before that the credentials committee was a group of volunteer pastors who represented local churches and local Baptists. What is this recommendation saying is going to happen now? We're going to hire a full-time guy. So what's the positive? Somebody has more time to do it. What's the negative? That's, yeah, any, anybody could train them. And these people may or may not be members of local Southern Baptist churches, which means they may or may not appropriately represent Southern Baptist schism, like the local church. There's a positive and a negative to each one, okay? Just, I want you to feel the difficult part of making this decision. That's number one. Number two, we request that for the implementation of sexual abuse reforms for the first year, the executive committee recommend to the messengers of the 2022 SBC annual meeting that $3 million be allocated from the cooperative program overage and from a portion of the Vision 2025 budget. Now, what, was the co what is the cooperative program? Quick Baptist quiz. What is, it, what is it for? Missions and seminary training. All right, so each church gives a, a portion of money for the express purpose of sending missionaries. What is this recommendation saying that we're now using that money for? Yeah, in no, the IMB put a report out this morning, Dr. Chitwood, whom I love, by the way, International Mission Board guy, put a report out this morning, and in the kindest language possible, it's pretty impressive how he did this. I have to send it to you. It's awesome. In the kindest way possible, said that number, three million, when, it come, when we begin to implement as an IMB everything else that's happening and you take that money away, it actually looks a little bit more like $4.5 million that's going to be coming away from missions. And this is just the first year. Guess what's going to happen next year? They're going to, yeah, right? Now that, that $4.5 million represents, somebody else did the math, so the numbers may be wrong. It's not my fault. It wouldn't be surprising if the numbers were wrong because I did the math, but it, still, I'm leaning on someone else that did this. Each missionary annually costs about $60,000 to keep on the field, all right? That's, that's everything. That's all the paperwork expenses. That's, all, that's everything that we support a missionary with, okay? That means that somehow or the other, there's going to be somewhere between 70 to 75 missionaries that will not be funded because the money is going, that $3 million is going to pay the expenses that are incurred 
from pastors of local churches that are guilty of these things. And those pastors that have been included in the report are pastors of the churches that represent the top 1% of all the churches in the convention. Yes. The positive is that there's some restitution that's taking place. That's a good thing. We don't argue that that shouldn't happen. What's the bad? Ah, yeah, you're taking money away from missions and giving it. Now, I'll give you, I'll give you a thing to do. I've, we, this, this is on, um, and you don't have to do this right now. At some point today, just go home and look up SBC Abuse Lawyer, and you're going to find ad after ad after ad after ad after ad of lawyers who are now lining up and saying, have you been abused by Southern Baptist Church? Contact us. So what happens, how fast does that three million or four and a half million go when you've got lawyers 10 miles deep? Not, that doesn't go very far. And so if you create, so here's the tension. If you create a precedent that the money that we've designated for missions goes to pay restitution towards local autonomous Southern Baptist churches, again, understand, local church autonomy, right? So now you're saying that the denominational entity is going to begin paying to, you know, restitution for independent churches who've done really bad things. Nobody's saying those things are good. Then what is the precedent going forward for the money in the cooperative program? It is, yes. Where else are you going to take it from? That's the problem. The tension is, there's, huh? Yeah, I mean, yeah, I, yeah, that's what we would say. Okay, can I get everybody okay if I give you my personal opinion on this for just a matter, for just a second? My personal opinion on this is if you're a pastor of a 14,000-member church, 15,000-member church, and you did something stupid, your 15,000-member church ought to be responsible to pay for it. Or at least the insurance policy that your 15,000-member church has, has established. Okay, so that's yeah, if you did if there's something wrong there, then something wrong then something right should happen in terms of justice. But is it the responsibility of the denomination to do that? And that's the difficult part about Baptist policy because if you say yes, well then what else is it the responsibility of the denomination to do? Like you when you to say yes to this is to fundamentally transform everything that it means to be Southern Baptist. Does that make sense to everybody? This is not an easy decision to make. It's not an easy decision. And I've got good, dear brothers and sisters on both sides of this. I'm on the side that says these people absolutely should have justice, but they should not have justice at the expense of sending missionaries around the world. That's, that's where I'm at. Does that make sense? So, so this is, uh, we've gotten to the second one. There's like 20 of these. <laughs> All right, but this already, you feel the tension. I said there's, there's good on both, there's people on both sides, there's good Christians on both sides, and this is, Anaheim's going to be very interesting. Yes, Kevin. Yes. Yes. Yes, correct. Me too. <laughs> yeah, yeah, correct. And that is probably the case. I think most of them knew. So I've been a trustee, not at a, not the denominational, but I've been a trustee before. And I can tell you there's a lot that goes on that you just don't hear about. So I, I give you an example. I've been on the board of directors for Foothills Family Resources for seven years now. Okay, I can tell you for a fact that at a board meeting, you cannot do, you cannot cover everything that that organization has done over the last quarter. You just can't do it. There's just too much. And so the responsibility and this is where the failure, if it's, if it's true, Kevin, then here's where the failure happened. The responsibility of the executive director is to look through this information, find the most pertinent and important, give a 30,000-foot view, 
and bring those really important and pertinent issues to the Board of Trustees so that the Board of Trustees is informed and aware. That's, 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 if everything was roses and puppies, then what happened here was that Ronnie Floyd, EC director, and all the guys before him just failed to tell the trustees. I don't think that's the case. I think that, personally, I think that Ronnie Floyd and the board of, and it failed to tell some of the trustees. I believe that. I think there are some people who legitimately didn't know. But I also think there are a lot of people that did, and they, didn't they chose to do nothing. Because who's going to indict Paige Patterson or Jack Graham or, you know, Johnny Hunt? These guys are... These guys are just a step below Jesus in the Southern Baptist world, right? I say that very tongue-in-cheek. I don't actually believe that. But, boy, there are a lot of people who do. And so, so I think that there's, there are a great many of the trustees who covered up. But I, I, So I can tell you, I've sat down and had lunch with Dwight Easler, who is our trustee for the state of South Carolina. I tell you, for, I, I believe him. He is pastor of Corinth Baptist Church in Gaffney, South Carolina. He's a volunteer fireman, good old fellow, just, you know, just like us. And he looked me dead in the eyes, and he's either an excellent liar and a pastor, or he's telling me the truth, and he said, I did not know any of this. Now, should I have gone looking for this information? Probably, but I didn't even know to look for it until it started coming up at 18 or 19. So I think there were a few guys who really didn't know anything. I would not say... And so guys that I trust and love would say it's a blanket, wholesale, 100% cover-up. I just, again, I, just don't think, I, think, I don't think that's true. I think there are some folks who really, truly didn't know. And the reason that those guys didn't know is because if they had, they'd have blown it up. And so you keep that information from those guys. Yes. Yes. Yes, that is, yes, absolutely. Okay, so let's keep going. So third, we request that all entity boards and standing committees have training regarding sexual abuse prevention and survivor care as part of their orientation and selection. I'm cool with this. I think this is a great idea. I think every pastor should have that kind of training, right? Because there are certain responsibilities that we as pastors have with the information that we are given, right? If I'm given information that someone on my staff or even in my church is, is guilty of abuse or a victim of abuse. I don't have a choice. Do you guys understand this, right? Like, I don't have a choice in what I do with that information. I have to report that. And for me to not report that is a crime. But, you know, it's funny how many guys I've run into who actually didn't, didn't know this, right, or didn't know how serious it was. It's called being a mandatory reporter. I am a mandatory reporter. Right. So if somebody comes to me, comes into my office and says, Pastor, you cannot tell anybody what I'm about to tell you. The first thing I will tell you is I cannot promise that to you. I will not promise that to you. I will promise to you that I will do the very best that I can to glorify the Lord and to protect people. Now, you tell me what you need to tell me because I can't. You can't do that. That that's just you just can't do that. Right. And so the idea of, of care, of, of actual training, I think is a great idea. I actually don't mind us using, because part of the money that's allocated is allocated towards training and encouragement of pastors. There's a whole part of the budget that goes towards continuing education for pastors. Great! That's fine. Let's, let's do that. Don't have a problem with three. So, so far, we're one out of three of the recommendations that may or may not have bad consequences. Okay, four. We request that all denominational workers, volunteers, and students, and all entities are given training on sexual abuse prevention and survivor care. I mean, okay, that's fine. Again, still, it's not, not the end of the world. Make it a seminary class. You've got to take 96 hours in seminary to graduate with a master's degree at a Southern Baptist school. Some of that is redundant. So just give me a class on it. Let me graduate. Fine, okay? Five, we encourage all churches and Baptist bodies to participate in the SBC sexual abuse assessment, which is it's kind of a self-check thing where you as a church look and see do you have policies in place? If there were to be something that were to happen, is your church prepared? We've already, for what it's worth, we've, we have already done this here. Like, there's a reason there's a safety team in place. There's a reason that Ruth Ann set up a children's policy here many, many years ago that we live by. There's a reason that you've got to go down there and physically pick up your children in order to, p in order to check them out from a quip class. There's a reason that just, that, you know, we lock all of the doors during the, like, all of these things we're already doing. And so, you know, I, that's fine. We can do that. We're already doing them. Okay. Now, challenges for state conventions. We request that state conventions consider 
having a designated trained staff person or independent contractor to receive calls regarding allegations of sexual abuse and provide initial guidance. In other words, the national denomination realizes that they're still not going to have the staff necessary to handle all of these cases. And so not only now are we adding new employees at the national level, in order to keep up with everything, we've got to add new employees now at the state level too, right? We requested state conventions in consultation with LifeWay and the executive committee add a series of questions on the annual church profile regarding background checks and sexual abuse training. I mean, I don't have a problem with that, but it's not going to do anything. Okay, annual church profile. Let me explain that. ACP. The ACP is a report that we fill out every year as a church that just gives, it's, it's a numbers report. It, it takes care, of, it, it, it gives them an idea of the three B's of Southern Baptist life. You guys ever heard this? Budgets, bottoms, and, uh, and buildings. It tells them all the numbers that are associated with those things. So budgets, it tells you how, how, much, how much is your church spending this year on this, how much is it spending on that. It's all, we don't have to give it. Right? We don't have to do this. We're not required to do this. In fact, only about 20% of Southern Baptist churches currently do the SCT. Okay? Uh, bottoms, how many people are at your different worship service? How many people are going to Sunday school? How many people are doing this and that and the other? So if you hear or read a report that says, you know, average membership of the Southern Baptist Convention is up by 14%. How did they, how, is that, you're never going to hear that. But how would you get that number? Well, the answer is people turned in their ACPs, and the numbers that, that were on the ACPs that were turned in are higher than the numbers last year. Okay? And then buildings. So what is your resource allocation in terms of how you're using buildings and things like that? So, so that's ACP. So what they're saying now is the ACP, which is already, I think, last time I looked at it, was a 105-question document. They're going to add more questions to this 105-question document about background checks and things like that. I mean, it's fine, but it's not really going to accomplish anything. Why? It's not required. And only 20% of the church, they can't require it. Only 20% of the churches do it anyway. So, I mean, I'm kind of neutral about this because I just don't think it's going to accomplish anything. You want to write more questions on the little form that nobody fills out, you go ahead and write more questions on the little form that nobody fills out. It'll be fine. Okay? So, there's that. Um, we request that state conventions maintain a list of professionally trained, licensed, trauma-informed Christian counselors in their respective states for those churches who voluntarily seek assistance as they minister to survivors. Request that state conventions establish a self-certification program for churches including best practices in survivor care, hiring, investigatory protocols, and training for prevention. Hold on to that one. We request that all state entities and committees provide training regarding sexual abuse prevention and survivor care to their denominational workers, as well as background checks as part of their orientation and selection. It's like a Title IX thing. If you, if you work for a big company, then you have got to go through the sexual harassment training, things like that. What they're advocating for is that for the denomination, you go to work for the denomination, you have to have a similar type of training. Okay? I, there's good and bad on it. I, okay. Second, that was all part of the first recommendation. Second, the need for structural and meaningful changes in the SBC. Yes, the, the task force recommends the following action for approval by messengers. Recommendation one. That the messengers to the 2022 meeting of the Southern Baptist Convention approve the creation of an abuse reform implementation task force authorized to operate for one three-year term. The ARITF is to be appointed by the president elected by the 2022 convention who will also appoint its leadership. The ARITF is to be funded by the sexual abuse allocation requested by the executive committee. Now, hold on. This is one little sentence. So you get what they just did. So the task force was a group of pastors who spent the last year digging and doing all this research. A good buddy of mine, Marshall Blaylock, pastor at First Baptist Charleston, was the vice president of the task force. Okay? He's, he was gone one or two days a week, every week for six months, and was glad to do it. But... It was difficult. He's got grown kids. He's almost at retirement. He's got three people on his staff. He could do it, and so he did. Praise the Lord for that. Okay? Along with several other men and women who served on this team and who were, either, who were either not vocationally employed by the church or were, but they were all lay people. 
Now what we're asking to happen is the same task force to be a permanent thing, because when you do something, okay, this is where the SBC is very much like the federal government. If you create something for three years, what happens to it? You just created something forever, right? And so we want to create this thing for three years, and instead of having lay people as a part of this team, who's now part of this team? Paid denominational employees using the same resources that we were talking about allocating back here. So now you got $3 million that's going a whole bunch of different directions. How far is that money going? Not very far. Okay, so, so in other words, it, I, I read this one. My first impression of this was I read this and said, so they're telling me that the answer is bigger government. I mean, that's it. The answer to this problem is for us to just hire more people. If we've tried this. This, okay, all right, keep going. It's to be appointed by the president-elect by the 2022 convention, so you've increased the power of the SBC presidency. All right, the SBC presidency is a figurehead position right now, but now the SBC president gets to appoint these paid people who work directly for him and who have the responsibility of going and identifying churches that are not in compliance with the regulations. What did you just create? You just created a team of witch hunters. So, it gets downhill from here. All right, we'll report to each annual session of the convention. All right, specifically, ARITF will be charged to study the guidepost recommendations for feasibility and bring an initial report to the 2023 annual meeting on which reforms could be adopted by the convention and how they should be implemented, including guidepost recommendations for a survivor care fund and a memorial auditing the Caring Well curriculum and the possible creation of a permanent committee. There it is. Assist SBC entities in studying the recommendations from Guidepost and provide advice on voluntary implementation of reforms relevant to each entity's ministry assignment. Okay, so they're going to give recommendations to all of the different entities in the SBC on what they should do. How many of these will actually be recommendations? There's going to be less recommendations and more commandments. Yeah, all right. In consultation with the Credentials Committee, revise the evaluation and submission process, and then finally work with the Executive Committee and Credentials Committee to select an independent firm or firms to assist the Credentials Committee by providing factual findings for complaints of non-cooperation due to sexual abuse. In other words, they come to a church and they say, you need to do these things, and you say, we're an autonomous church, we're not going to do these things, then they report you for non-cooperation. Then they report you for non-cooperation, you go before the Credentials Committee, and the Credentials Committee will listen to these reports and then will vote that you are no longer a Southern Baptist church. And the church has no say in any of it. What could possibly go wrong? That sinking feeling, if you're feeling it, in the pit of your stomach, is what happens when the Southern Baptist Convention doesn't actually want to change. I'll explain why I mean that in just a second. All right, so, so there's a whole lot of rationale here, and those are the two recommendations. Let me explain what I, I think happened and why I plan to vote the way I plan to vote. I believe that justice should be done for these people. I believe that these folks were wronged, that they were treated terribly, and I don't believe that these instances are alone. This investigation that took place in the executive committee took place in the smallest, the smallest denominational entity in the Southern Baptist Convention, and we got 288 pages worth of problems. What happens if you investigate the North American Mission Board, or the IMB, or the seminaries, or the ERLC? all of whom are bigger than the executive committee. Do you guys get the problem here? But nowhere in these recommendations, nowhere do you read these people saying, we think that this investigation co should cover the scope of the denomination, top to bottom. All denominational entities should be investigated to see how they have mishandled these problems. You know why? Because there is still a group of people who want to take out a good old boy system and then put a new one in. That's really what's happened is we took a good intention, because this is what we do as Southern Baptists, we took a good intention and we absolutely poisoned it by the pursuit of power. I heard, I heard 
two weeks ago. I thought it was super insightful. I don't always agree with what this, actually I very rarely agree with what this author said. But I thought this was insightful. They said the primary, we say often as Southern Baptists that the distinguishing characteristic of the Southern Baptist Convention is missions. He said, but in reality, the distinguishing characteristic of the Southern Baptist Convention is power. That really, the keeping and then wrestling away of power at the denominational level is the thing that has generally identified what it means to be Southern Baptist. And that is heartbreaking, and yet pretty true. So, I can't, here's, here's what I, the first thing that, that I know is going to happen is that they are going to, the task force is going to put this forth at a meeting early in the morning on Tuesday morning to try to get it done before the majority of the delegates get in the room. I'm going to be there 30 minutes before it starts, sitting in my seat with my little ballot in my hand, ready to go, okay? They're going to try to get it done quickly. I also know that when the, we get to speak to the motion that there's at least 10 guys, of whom I am one, that are going to be very quick to stand up and say, we don't want to vote on all these things at one time. We want to get to vote on each individual motion. Now, the difference is, so, so you understand what they're going to do is everything I just read to you and explained to you line by line, the average delegate that's coming to the SBC, not only have they probably not read it, they also probably haven't had a pastor that would stand here and explain it all to them, right? Because we've got to make the SBC look good. I care nothing about making the SBC look good. I care everything about exalting Jesus and glorifying him. That's what I care about, right? And so, so most delegates are going to come in, and they're not going to hear these, each individual thing. They're, they're not going to be thinking through the ramifications of these things, unless they're really carefully thought out people, which some will be. But there's a lot of them that just won't be, and they'll look around and see how the majority of the people are voting, and they'll raise their ballots, right, because they still they trust the convention. And so, so there's, there's going to be at least a few of us who are going to stand up and say, I would like to make a motion that we vote on each individual aspect, one line at a time, of all of these things. And in order to do that, we're going to try to move it to a Tuesday evening session. In other words, when everything's done at the end of the day on Tuesday, we're going to devote the rest of that time. And if we're there till 2 o'clock in the morning, we're there till 2 o'clock in the morning, where we individually, line by line, vote. Now, whether or not that wins, I hope it does, because there is some good in here. There is. There is some real good in here. Not even get to the database. They're going to promote the idea of having a database. But the, the database, the problem with what they're presenting is that they're going to present that we have a database for the Southern Baptist Convention that includes any credible accusation of sexual abuse and that pastor's name. Now, what's the problem with that? Yeah, due process. That's the problem. Ah, and uh, guideposts, and it said, and when you get to the definition that they give in the report, it is that it is more likely than not that abuse occurred. So as a pastor, let me tell you what, every pastor I know lives in fear that one day some young lady gets really mad at them and accuses them of something that they did not do, because I personally know, I was telling Ruth Anderson this weekend, I personally know a guy who was a youth pastor in this town who got accused of something that he did not actually do. And he has never gotten to work another day in his life in ministry. You're one false accusation away from losing everything. Right? So now what happens? This same person makes this accusation for the, to this same guy who gets reported to a database and his ministry is over even if he's innocent. That's not what I wanted at all. That's not what I wanted. What I wanted was people who were actual, legitimate, convicted sex offenders to be on a registry database so that churches around the country could access it and see if this person has actually committed a crime. That's good. That's a good thing. But what we do is we took the good thing and we put it as part of this other desire for power. Yes. No, that's part of the training that they're advocating to do is that we train churches that they are called to report. But nowhere in here is there any advocation that the executive committee itself understand its obligation to report because the answer's got to be bigger government.
Yes. Man, that is a hundred percent accurate. Yes, I, you you read you, you you spend too much time in the SBCs, and you feel like you just finished reading Orwell. Right? That that we're going to tell you what to think, and you'll be happy, sort of thing, you know. And we cover it up with all kinds of so yeah. You know, it, it it comes back to I mean, you read in the report that that literally this stuff starts coming out. And Augie Bodo, I think I read this quote to you, read, said this is all a tool of Satan to distract people from evangelism. No, it's not. It's, it's actually trying to point out there's a real problem here, and we need to take care of it. And so, just so you know, if we cannot get these items separated, I cannot, in good conscience, vote for something that takes basically all of the authority of the local church away from the local church. I just can't do it. Do you guys understand why? Does that make sense? It has nothing to do with me being against abuse i am 100 percent against abuse and i am still planning on fighting the right ways to see that these people have justice done but this is not it this is taking a the, taking a young lady and making her a token and a reason to either keep power or take power from powerful people and give it to other powerful people and that is every bit as much abuse as the abuse that she experienced the first time and we ought to be ashamed of this the sad part is we're not. <laughs> so, there you go. The dismal future of the Southern Baptist Convention. Really exciting, isn't it? Yes. Yes. That is 100% correct. They are, they're, they're, they're using it to either get more power or to take power from people so that they would have it. Yes. And then protect people. And, and, and the, real, the difference is, it's not, as it stands right now, this is not created to keep powerful people from being protected. It's created to protect different powerful people. Does that make sense? Like, that's really what it's there to do. So, for what it's worth, can I give you a couple of bright spots? <laughs> There's a really, really, really awesome candidate for the president of the Southern Baptist Convention. His name is Tom Askell. I've known or been around Tom Askell for many, many years. Solid guy, theologically conservative, actually decent, really good theologian. Um, has a really good view of the local church and ecclesiology, and I honestly think he's got a really good chance of winning. And if he does, then this will be the first stuff to get dismantled. He'll say, nope, we've got to change this, and he'll advocate as much as he can to change it and to see that it's changed. Um, so, so that's, that's a bright spot. Another bright spot is there's a whole bunch of pastors of churches our size who are telling their congregations the same sort of thing that I'm telling you and finding their congregations to be just as disgusted by it as you are, which is why we are not just leaving this year. Does that make sense? It's why I'm not going, we're out the door. Everything I just told you makes me sick to my stomach. I've, this stuff, if I would let it, keeps me up at night. I hate it. I hate it. I hate it. There's a reason I don't work for the state convention anymore. I saw too much of it. Right. And so I want to see if there's a groundswell, a legitimate groundswell of local autonomous churches that go, wait, this this is enough Then I want to be a part of that, because truly, I still love our missionaries. <laughs> I still love the fact that if you're a missionary, you don't have to fundraise. If you're a Southern Baptist, you can be called to a place, educated and go and spend 25 years there and never have to worry about raising a dime. That is phenomenal, and there's no other denomination of cooperating, cooperation of churches in the world that does that, which is why, as a church, we don't give money to the cooperative program. We give money directly to the International Mission Board because we want to support missionaries and not pork, and so that's what we do, right? But So I, so I don't want to just walk away from that mission structure because I love it. I really, really love it. I hate all the rest of it. I love that. And so I want to stay and see, can we and, you know, thousands of other guys legitimately make a difference? And you know what? The answer might be no. Okay, well, then there's a, there's a terminal date. We're going to try it. It's a, it's a battleship. It takes time to turn around. So there ain't no way we're going to come to the end of this convention and everything's going to be just 100% better. It's just not how it works. 
But boy, we can make a big difference. And so I want to see, can we actually make a big difference? Because this, all of this, has caught the attention. I don't mean anything demeaning generationally. It's caught the attention of all the non-baby boomer Southern Baptists. Right? I mean, it has. Because the, the boomers were, were growing up in a generation where they really believed they could trust the Southern Baptist Convention. The Southern Baptist Convention was all about missions and evangelism, had the best interests of the people in mind, and they, they single-handedly rescued the Southern Baptist Convention for theological liberalism. Yay, us! They really believe all that, right? And some of it, some of it's true, a lot of it's not, but the internet didn't exist. And so you believed what you were told from denominational entities. Like this, all of this, none of this would have broken loose for what it's worth. I spent weeks and weeks and weeks on how phones are changing us. None of this would have broken loose had it not been for the internet and phone technology. Truly, it just wouldn't have. It would have, they would have, it would have been much easier to keep all this stuff under wraps, Right? So I, I legitimately think there's either, either one of two things is going to happen in the next three years. Either one, the SBC as a whole is going to change, or two, the SBC is going to split. And then we won't be one, it'll be thousands of churches that are going to have the same sort of problems with this stuff as we do, and there will hopefully, if that happens, be a new cooperative way to support missions while still advocating for justice and reducing the amount of port, if you will, that exists in denominationalism. It's one of those two things, and I feel like we just kind of need to wait and see which one of those it is. So it is 9.59. I have one minute for questions. Yes, Jonathan! Hey, good job! Oh, oh, what? Oh, okay. Man, got my hopes up. great question I would I would go I would go to first Timothy three the qualifications or is it two three qualifications a pastor must have a good reputation among outsiders right right it does Yeah, so then the question, the question would be, can that same guy, if you're talking about outsiders in a local context, could that same guy who is innocent go somewhere where nobody knows him and do ministry where he no longer has a bad reputation with the outsiders in the community and context in which he's pastoring? That's, that's the complex question. And look, good people answer yes or no on both sides of those things, right? So, so I would say that one. But the man is still innocent, and there still is due process in this country. And if we promote his name, put his name on a database when he's literally done nothing wrong, then in a real sort of way, we have circumvented and undermined due process that our forefathers fought and died for. That's still not right. Yes. To yes, I, I say absolutely. And any case of abuse that a person is actually found guilty of, disqual in my mind, and I think the scriptures warrant that, disqualifies them permanently from ministry. Not from heaven, but definitely from ministry. Right? I mean, I, I, just, I just can't see any way around that. Because, because the question would be, if a guy was guilty, all you parents, if a guy was guilty of a sin against a child, if a crime against a child was convicted, would you trust that man to pastor your children? I mean, really? You know, I mean, I, I guess if I'll be honest with you, I wouldn't. I wouldn't. And so, no. Can they be a member of the church? Yes. Can they be involved in the life of the church? Yes. Is there grace and forgiveness? Yes, but sin has consequences. And it's funny, we literally teach our kids this, and we just don't apply it real well as grown-ups. Sin has consequences. So to me, those are, those are two fundamentally different questions. One, I'm a little bit wishy-washier on the answer of. But is a, if, a, if a person commits a, an, a crime against a child, they should not pastor. Like, I, I just don't, I mean, and that has nothing to do with believing in grace or not grace. But it has everything to do with believing that some sins have consequences. Lingering, long-term consequences, because we live in a broken world. So, yeah, that's my personal view. Yes, Bob.
Yes. <laughs> the, the primary concern of the Southern Baptist Convention is the numbers. How many people are being baptized? They'll start with that. How many baptisms are taking place? But I'll give you another example. You know, if, if you look at the average age of baptisms in the Southern Baptist Con Convention, it's somewhere less than eight years old. I mean, truly, right? So I don't know if there's one with baptizing an eight-year-old. There's something wrong with the average age being less than eight years old. Why? Because if we're really concerned about evangelism, what does the median age of our baptisms look like? It's higher, right? I mean, it's cool to evangelize children. It's awesome to evangelize children. Also cool to evangelize grown-ups. So, so, you know, so there's that. The, the budget, you know, the, the things you're going to hear, the things that I'm going to hear, that I'm already planning on, preparing myself for, that we celebrate as a denomination at the annual meeting, are how much money we brought in. That'll be the first one. You know, that we've exceeded the cooperative program budget this year by some number of millions of dollars. Well, I mean, that's great. That's okay. You know, awesome. But, but then the next thing will be how many, you know, how many baptisms we've had which is great, but that will be secondary to the amount of money. Uh, it just will. Like I said, I don't want to sugarcoat stuff for you. So, no. No, I mean, I've been in meetings. I've been in meetings at the national level and the state level where the first thing we look at is um, how much a church gives. Am I, are we still recording? then I'm not going to tell you the story I was getting ready to tell you. <laughs> so, yeah, all right, Any 10.05. I'll be around. If you guys want to ask questions one-on-one, -on -one, please do. I, I want to be as transparent as possible. I think most of the problem in the SBC for the last hundred and something years has been lack of transparency. So I want to be transparent. So if you've got questions, ask them. Okay, let's pray. Lord, sometimes the hardest thing for us to do is to jettison all of this garbage and, uh, and focus on you and your glory. Uh, but, Father, the, the truth is we don't, we don't bring appropriate honor and glory to your name during our worship time if we don't set this aside so that we might focus on you. Lord, I pray that you'd help us uh, because this is heavy and it's hard. And you're... you're um, you're bringing darkness to light so many different ways, and, and Lord, we rejoice in that. I pray that you'd give us wisdom to know how to act and what to do. I pray for our, for our leaders here, that you'd help us. Lord, we don't make decisions in a vacuum, and we don't make them alone. So I pray that you'd help us as a leadership team to think well about what you're calling us to do, how you're calling us to respond to this. But Lord, this morning, we're going to be studying the book of Acts. We're going to be, we're going to be celebrating 3,000 souls saved in one day at Pentecost. We're going to be taking the Lord's table together and thinking about the unity that exists in the bond of peace among your people. So, Father, help us to transition well, to set these things aside so that we might fix our eyes on Christ, the author and perfecter of our faith. 